With the 2024 draft right around the corner, we finally find out who's going to be in attendance. That plus a whole lot more comes up on Friday's edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast for April 12th, 2024. Just win. Just win. Just win. Just win. The autumn win is a raider. Pillaging just for fun. He'll knock you round and upside down and laugh when he's conquered and won. And won. And welcome in Raider Nation to another edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast. Thank you so much for making the show your first listen of the day. Make sure you subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. To get the latest edition of the show as soon as it becomes available, as always, if you're giving us a look on YouTube, we definitely appreciate that. The show continues to grow each and every day, and that's because of you, Raider Nation. We appreciate the support. And, of course, because of my man Ari does a fantastic job each and every day at Ari Produces on Twitter. If you want to hit him up, he'll definitely appreciate that. Of course, you can hit me up as well at your boy Q254. And we got the Locked On Raider podcast voicemail line at 707-654-4693. Got a loaded show for you uh, as we close out the week. Really strong, really excited about what we're bringing to you uh, on today's episode, including the calls and texts off that Locked On Raider podcast voicemail line. That'll come up in segment number three of the show. Segment number two, man, oh man, let me tell you, Mel Kuyper Jr., my guy. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, he had his pre-draft conference call number two on Thursday for ESPN, and it was one hour long, one hour strong, so I got some sound bites just from that, but then the double down, how cool is this? The double down from just the sound bites and the conference call that I was on, I was actually able to have him as a guest on my radio show on game night on ESPN uh, Thursday night as well. So it's so funny when he came on the show, he was like, Q, you got any more questions? You already asked me a couple earlier. And I was like, yeah, hey, we can do this all night, man. I'm good. So uh, really awesome. It's one of my goals to be able to uh, interview Mel Kuyper just, you know, one-on-one. Of course, I had a co-host on my ESPN show, but just to have him as a guest on my show or be a guest on his show has always been one of my goals. So maybe I'll bring that conversation to the podcast on Monday, but was able to double down and have that with Mel on uh, on Thursday night on game night on ESPN radio. So that was really cool. But you'll hear a few sound bites from him and that pre-draft conference call. A lot of really good stuff, all NFL draft related. You'll hear that in segment number two. Here in segment number one, news and notes of the day, what I was able to collect. And we'll start off with guys that are going to be at the NFL draft in, in, uh, in Detroit, April 25th. We'll jump right into that after I tell you about the title sponsor of the show, which is FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150, win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started today. I'll tell you more about them later on in the show. But you know the draft is right around the corner when you finally get to find out who's going to be in Detroit, who's going to be in the green room. That is actually one of my favorite things about the draft is finding out who's going to be there, knowing that I'm going to be there to be able to cover it, knowing the kind of uh, coverage that they allow us to have, which is they have these draftees out around town and we're able to show up somewhere like last year. It was at a school that was actually connected to a a fire department, but they were out there with the play 60 kids and it was pretty cool. They do this uh, event with the kids and they probably do it for about an hour, but then they give us time to get on the field and actually talk to the prospects. And so that's part of the fun of the draft coverage. Uh, I'll always remember going back to 2019 in Nashville uh, when the draft was there and Josh Jacobs was coming out of Alabama, getting to uh, hang out with him at uh, at Nissan Stadium there in Tennessee and having a nice like, you know, six, seven minute conversation with them. And that's when I first met him and kind of established a relationship. And until the day he left the Raiders, you know, this last year when, when the week 18 was wrapped up, he wasn't playing in that game. We still had a really good relationship. So this is where the groundwork is laid. Last year was able to talk to Tyree Wilson uh, at that school that I was talking about that was attached to the fire department, was able to talk to him the day before he got drafted by the Raiders and then talk to him right after the draft. So hopefully that happens again. But the names have been rolled out of the players that are going to be there in attendance. And I have to say, It's not as many as I thought it was going to be. So Detroit's going to be a little bit of lacking when it comes to attendance. But the guys that will be there, and there's some fantastic players that are going to be there. Terion Arnold, cornerback out of Alabama, a guy that I could see the Raiders drafting at number 13. Quinion Mitchell, cornerback out of Toledo, same thing as Terion Arnold. Definitely could be a guy that the Raiders have on their radar. K. 
Caleb Williams, quarterback out of USC. He's going to go number one overall to Chicago. Jaden Daniels, quarterback out of LSU. We already know we've talked about him uh, in, in great length. It'd be fantastic if I'm talking to him following the draft and he's a Raider quarterback. That would be awesome. Uh, we don't see it really happening. Believe that Washington is going to pick him number two overall, but he's going to be there. So at the very least, I'll get a little time to talk to him the day before the draft. Drake May, quarterback out of North Carolina, he'll be in attendance. Darius Robinson, the edge out of Mizzou, he'll be there as well. Uh, Leatu Latu, edge out of UCLA, he'll be there. Get a chance to catch up with him. He's a guy I can see the Raiders having on their radar. Dallas Turner, linebacker out of Alabama, is a guy that gets after the quarterback in a major way. Uh, he's a guy that that uh, you know I'll definitely talk to as well. We know I yell roll tide all the time. <laughs> Sometimes for no reason at all, just yeah, happen to yell roll tide, right? Just because that's how... I get down. So Dallas Turner will be in attendance. Malik Neighbors, wide receiver out of LSU. Obviously, he played with Jaden Daniels. Uh, Brian Thomas Jr., also the wide receiver out of LSU, played with Jaden Daniels. Roma Dunze, wide receiver out of Washington. He'll be in attendance. Marvin Harrison Jr., wide receiver out of Ohio State, will be in attendance. And J.C. Latham, offensive tackle out of LSU. Those 13 guys will all be in attendance in Detroit April 25th. And the thing about it is they try to get the guys that they expect to get drafted in the first round. They don't want guys to be sitting there in round two. Like Geno Smith, uh, remember when he came out in the draft and he looked like he was going to be a first-round pick? He ended up staying until day two. And to his credit, I got to give him a lot of props, he actually stayed. He didn't leave. He stayed and waited for his name to get called, and they got called, what, first in the second round? Uh, So he stuck around, still got to walk across the stage. But they always try to not bring on guys that they think may have a chance to really slide and be there a long time or guys that are going to make it to day two. So they always try to focus in on just the day one guys. But kind of a surprise that there's only three quarterbacks, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, and Drake May, going to be there. No Michael Penix, no J.J. McCarthy, no Bo Nix. All guys that, you know, we've heard reports and rumors that they're going to go in the first round. J.J. McCarthy is going to go as high as number six. Now, again, it's not saying they didn't get an invite. It's just saying that they're not going to be there, right? And so they could have decided that, you know what, I don't want to go. I want to spend this time with my family and friends. We're going to have our own little party. They can do that as well. There's been plenty of players that have turned down the invite. But I was, I was, I was pretty surprised, I'm not going to lie, to see that there's only going to be 13 guys in attendance coming up on April 25th there in Detroit. Why do I say that? Well, last year I was in Kansas City. Last year the draft was in Kansas City. 17 guys attended it. So obviously a little bit more than what's going to happen in Detroit on April 25th where there's only 13 2022, it was in Vegas. There was 21 guys. Now, I don't think you got to really twist too many people's arms to come to Vegas, right? <laughs> if, you, if you ain't been to Vegas, and a lot of these players have never been to Vegas, right? They, they've told me that when I've interviewed them. Nope, never been there. I remember Sauce Gardner. I remember all those guys in that draft. Uh, there were so many of them. Again, 21 of them were in attendance. Talked to a lot. Like, nah, this is my first time being here. It's pretty cool. I like the city, you know? And so, and it was crazy because in 2022, the Raiders didn't have a first round pick, so I still got a chance to talk to all those guys, but I knew damn well that none of those guys were going to get selected by the Raiders because that was the Devontae Adams year. They didn't have a first round pick or a second round pick, so I knew that they weren't going to get uh, selected by the Raiders, but it was still cool to be able to catch up with them and you know get to meet them before they end up going uh, you know, to the draft and, or getting drafted and going to their teams. In 2021, it was Cleveland, but remember, it's 2021 and it's coming off the COVID year, so there was only 12 guys, but 42 guys were there um, by way of Zoom. So, I mean, that was still kind of like the COVID time. 2020 was obviously the COVID year, but 2021 draft, they were still being pretty cautious. So only 12 guys was actually in Cleveland. 42 of them uh, were in the green room, but it was virtually by way of Zoom. 2020, nobody, right? 2020 was supposed to be the year originally that Vegas was going to have the draft, and obviously that got canceled because of COVID. I thought 2020 was going to be my year. I told anybody who would listen, maybe I brought on 2020. No, I'm not going to put that on myself. But, man, 2020 was supposed to be my year. I thought it was going to be everything. Baylor had made it to the Sugar Bowl. That's obviously played in New Orleans. The Super Bowl was in Miami, going to go there to cover that. And then the draft was going to be in Las Vegas. you telling me that in a matter of about four and a half months, I was going to go from New Orleans to Miami to Vegas. That's the trifecta, man. I don't have to work the rest of the year. I've already done it all. But obviously, uh, COVID hit and everything got flipped upside down, and that wasn't the thing. So in 2020, it was virtual. Uh, nobody was in the green room. It was all by way of Zoom. But in, 19, in 2019, Nashville, I mentioned it earlier, 23 guys were there, including Josh Jacobs, and uh, that's when I got a chance to meet him. So you could tell that it's, it's, it's going down, right? It's going down as far as attendance. 23 in Nashville in 19, uh, 2022 in Vegas, it was 21, 2023, 17 in Kansas City. Now 
only 13 this upcoming year in Detroit. I'm sure some of that has to do with the city, but also some of it has to do with players probably not wanting to go there. or Maybe uh, they're not too sure who's going to be drafted in the first round or not. I remember uh, uh, Quentin Johnston, my guy from uh, Temple, Texas. I covered him in high school, went to TCU. He ended up being a first round wide receiver. Tom Telesco, as a matter of fact, drafted him in the first round for the Chargers. He originally, they were going to give him an invite, and then they heard at the last minute that they thought he was going to slide to round two, so they pulled the invite. He had a party at the house. He ends up going number 17 overall, so he could have been in the green room, but they didn't have him there. So sometimes, like I said, they try to be really careful about the situation. They don't want to set a guy up for failure, so the camera keeps panning to him, and what is he doing in the green room? You know what he's doing in the green room? He's sitting there. He's waiting to hear his name. He's doing bad. Right. I mean, I, I can't forget the Johnny Manziel seeing him until the Browns called his name. He's up there drinking beer. Remember Aaron Rodgers. Right. And there was others. Uh, again, Geno Smith, he lasted till day two. So they, they try to avoid that at all costs. They really want to see these guys go. So only 13 guys, but quality guys nonetheless. So uh, excited about the coverage that I'll be able to provide coming up, uh, you know, the week of the NFL draft there in Detroit. Also, one more little nugget I have for you for segment number one of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Then we'll get into some sound bites from Mel Geiper Jr. Coming up in segment number two, Tom Brady. He was uh, uh, appeared on the podcast, Deep Cut podcast. It actually came out on Thursday. And a lot of folks are running with this and thinking that Tom Brady's about to make a return to the NFL. I don't see that, and I don't interpret what he had to say as that. But the host of the podcast, uh, Vic Blends, he's it's like a barbershop-type scene. Everyone's doing a podcast at a barbershop. Hell, as much as I go to the barbershop, I should do a podcast my damn self. But <laughs> that's not the case. But everyone's doing a, a, a barbershop-type podcast. This one's called Deep Cut, and Vic Blends is the host. And he basically asks them, if a team comes calling, would you pick up the phone? Check it out. One day, there's a situation right maybe it's the 49ers maybe you know head into the playoffs offense is great Patriots somebody could be somebody, somebody Raiders look, could be you never know God forbid somebody goes down would you pick up that phone I'm not opposed to it if they would I don't know if they're gonna let me if I become an owner in the NFL team but I don't know if uh, I don't know I'm always gonna be in good shape always be able to throw the ball so to come in for a little bit like MJ coming back um, I don't know if they let me but I wouldn't be opposed to it so Everyone's thinking that, hey, Q, if, if the Raiders don't get their quarterback, do they call Tom Brady? Is he coming out of retirement? Look, I think that that ship has sailed. He didn't sound like a guy that was interested in playing a full season. And on top of that, he's still a Band-Aid, right? I mean, he might be the greatest of all time, might be the greatest Band-Aid of all time, but he would still only be a Band-Aid because he's not going to stick around for, what, four, five, six years. He's going to be a, a one-year guy at max. And even that soundbite right there was like, hey, at the end of the season, playoffs are on the line and someone gets injured, would you pick up the phone if they called? So I didn't take a whole lot of uh, you know stock in that, but some people did. I just wanted you to hear it so you can take it and, and, and take it for whatever interpretation you want to take it for. So that was, again, part of the Deep uh, Cut podcast that was released on Thursday. Vic Blend was the host talking there with Tom Brady. Coming up in segment number two, I was part of the pre-draft conference call number two for Mel Kuyper Jr. for ESPN. One hour long, one hour strong. I got a handful of sound bites that I want you to hear. We'll do that coming up in segment number two of today's Lock Raiders podcast. Before we get to that, though, I do want to tell you about eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for a winning championship is also what keeps your ride or die alive eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make the car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. All right, Raider Nation, here we go. Segment number two of today's Locked On, a Raiders podcast. Want to get into some breakdowns of the Mel Kuyper Jr., the pre-draft conference call number two that he had, and it's the final one that he's going to have before the NFL draft. He just released his final mock draft. He had some trades in there and everything. It was a two-round mock draft, uh, some really good stuff. And it's funny, you know, people talk about me saying his name the way I said it. When I actually interviewed him 
on my radio show on ESPN Radio on game night on uh, on Thursday night. I actually said it just like that. Mel Kuyper Jr. when I introduced him and all he did was laugh. He had a really good time. So for everyone that gets upset and thinks that, oh, Mel's going to get offended. You're disrespecting him. Mel's my guy, right? He actually said, Q, I'll come on your show every single night. We can kick it. And hey, man, look, I told him you better not say that to me because I'll have you on the show every single night. But uh, great guy. Uh, really appreciate his time and appreciated the, the pre-draft conference call that he had on Thursday. So let's go ahead and jump into uh, some of the sound bites from it. Matter of fact, the first sound bite I have for you is actually the first question that I asked um, on the call, and that was about trades. When does he think trades are going to start to happen in the draft? Because obviously Raider Nation is interested in some trades. Q, that's a great question. I think trades will happen early. That's why I started to project some. It's my final mock. So in the final mock, I break all the any rule I had, and there's no rules that you can do whatever you want there. And doesn't distort the draft because you're going to start seeing this. And we know, now we know a little bit more from Meta and character standpoint, the interviews, a lot of it's the work's been done. So I think you're going to start early on with the quarterback, J.J. McCarthy or Drake May. Somebody's going to be aggressive there. You could see some teams aggressively try to move up to get a corner like Quinion Mitchell Toledo or Terry and Arnold from Alabama. Brock Bowers drops a little bit. Maybe somebody moves up to get him. I'm going to see if Buffalo moves up to get a receiver, uh, which they could. Um, certainly Dallas needing an offensive lineman as desperately as they do. Are they going to sit and wait? Green Bay needs one as well. So I think there could be a lot of activity there. So that's what he's talking about when it comes to trades. Again, Mel Kuyper Jr. on his pre-draft conference call. That was part one of my question that I asked him, and then I doubled down and asked him about the quarterbacks and Michael Penix and Bo Nix. Obviously, two guys that have gotten a lot of hype. Michael Penix, obviously, more hype than Bo Nix has gotten, but, uh, you know, it's, everyone's talking about first-round uh, quarterbacks, first-round quarterbacks. There could be six quarterbacks taken in the first round. This is going to be an epic class, you know, like 1983, which 1983, I don't want to put that on this class because 1983 is proven already. So this class will have to do that as well. But I asked Mel about Mel, uh, Michael Penix and Bo Nix if they are first round or second round guys. Really good breakdown here from Mel Kuyper Jr. I think Michael Penix Jr., if you can reconcile the medical, he's a first round caliber quarterback. It's just the four injuries at Indiana. It's either going to prevent you or it's going to, if you can reconcile it and you're okay with the medical, he's a first round caliber player. If you can say, okay, Bo Nix doesn't have the big arm, but I see some similarities to Drew Brees, I can reconcile taking him in the first round. So again, you know, I would say the Rams are a team. I have them moving up to get Penix. I have the Giants moving up to get Knicks. Um, so we'll see. But I, I think right now that, you know, those quarterbacks are in the mix. They're a borderline first. Will one of the two become a first-round pick? More than likely, one of those two will. So there you go. I mean, look, Michael Penix probably is not a first-round pick. Bo Nix, probably not a first-round pick. Does that mean that they won't go in the first round? No, not at all. That just means that they probably don't have a first-round pick. So, you know, a, a grade on them from different teams. But as he mentioned, it only takes one team to say that, hey, the medicals on Michael Penix is cool. We'll go ahead and, and make the move for him. I, I mean, I could see it, even though, you know, again, like on, on the locked on mock draft, you know, Michael Penix didn't go at all in the first round. Right. I passed on him at 13 and just kind of uh, crossed my fingers. I was like, OK, I think that, uh, you know, he, he probably can make it to the end of round one. And he did. Nobody selected him in round one. Now, that doesn't mean that that's going to happen in the real draft coming up on April 25th, but you hear Mel's breakdown right there of Michael Penix and Bo Nix. Uh, one team that we've been eyeing and looking at as far as trades go are the Patriots in there at number three. And I don't know if that's going to be good enough for the Raiders to go get their guy, Jaden Daniels. I believe he's going to be a Washington commander. And, you know, the funny thing is I was talking to Vinny Bonsignor on my radio show on Thursday, and he said, look, the Raiders, if they trade to number three, it'll be on draft day because then they know that their guy is still there. But if they trade to number two, it'll be before draft day. So I thought that that was some good, you know, little breakdown there from Vinny Bonsignor. But here's Mel on why the Patriots at number three would even be interested in trading back. It has. This would have to be. If I don't have strong conviction on Drake May or J.J. McCarthy, you don't take them. So just because everybody else likes them or some people like this guy doesn't mean you have to like them. Look at all the busts that have gone in the top 10 of the first round over the years, right? So if you don't love these two, you don't take them. Then you say, well, do you love Michael Penix Jr. or Bo Nix? You got to like one. Of, you got to love one of those four. I mean, there's no way or really like one of those four for a team that desperately needs a quarterback uh, in a division with quarterbacks and a division an AFC will load it with great quarterbacks. Are you kidding me? You got to get one of the four. So I, it's going to be really interesting and fascinating to see which of the four they like the best. If it's not May who, or McCarthy, what do they do? Then you would trade out and take Penix Jr. or Knicks. But again, I'd be surprised if it's not Drake May or J.J. McCarthy. And right now I'm leaning Drake May. So obviously the Patriots have a lot of, of building to do. 
They don't have a lot of talent on the team. There's a reason why Bill Belichick is not the coach there anymore because he's been the de facto GM and he hasn't been able to bring in a lot of talent. So that would be the reason if they're not sold on whoever that quarterback number three is, if that's not their guy, maybe they looked at Jaden Daniels as hey, that's the only guy that we'd want. And then boom, they, uh, they, they, he's already gone number two. So that's why they're willing to trade back. Or maybe Drake may was their guy and he's gone at number two and they're willing to trade. And maybe the Raiders can jump up and go get Jaden Daniels. But that would be the reason why they're not sold on all the quarterbacks. They're only sold on one of the quarterbacks, and he's already gone. So moving on again with some pre-draft uh, breakdowns from Mel Kuyper's conference call that he had on Thursday is about Jaden Daniels. And again, it's presumed that he's going to end up being a Washington commander. He's going to get picked number two right behind Caleb Williams. So the question was posed to Mel about how Jaden Daniels fits in on Cliff Kingsbury's offense. I love this answer because he flips it where it's not really about Cliff's offense, it's really about Jaden Daniels and how Cliff is going to adapt to him. Well, I'm more also into how do you tailor your offense to suit what the quarterback does. And when you, you know, Lamar Jackson came to Baltimore when they had Joe Flacco, they had a change from a pocket passer to a Lamar Jackson who can is a dual threat. You get Jaden Daniels, he's a dual threat. You got to make sure that you can adapt and do what he does best, put him in a comfortable position and just let it go. He's going to be a lot of improv, and that's what it is with Lamar. Now, you know, there have been comps. Uh, Herm Edwards, who recruited Jaden, compares to Randall Cunningham. So I think Jaden was the one quarterback this year. Of all the quarterbacks, he was the one quarterback from start to finish, didn't have a, a blemish, didn't have a hiccup. And he did everything perfectly. And he had to carry that team on his shoulder. He had to win, get points in the fourth quarter because the defense couldn't stop anybody. And he had to run throw and he had to be aggressive with his legs and his arm and not turn it over, which he didn't with fumbles or interceptions. That's rare. So that's a, there's a reason why he went from fourth round to second pick in the draft. And his mom, Regina, who does great work for Jaden, checked, you know, did all her due diligence. I spoke to Regina last year, the year when there was talk about him coming out. Talk to her at great length about the advantages of staying. I encourage her to stay and Jaden to have Jaden stay at our, at LSU for another year for this particular reason to win awards, which is great, but also be a quarterback who will gain from that experience and maybe become Joe Burrow. And he ex did exactly that. It couldn't have been scripted any better. He did exactly what Joe Burrow did in year two at LSU after transferring from another school. So uh, for Jaden, that, that to me is no reason to overthink it. If you're Washington, I know the Raiders want him because of the Antonio Pierce connection to Jaden. I'm sure Jaden would love to play for the Raiders and Antonio Pierce. But guess what? We control it. We're the organization that has to pick. We need a quarterback. It'd be great to have Lamar in Baltimore and, and Jaden in, in Washington. To have those two that close that are phenomenal quarterbacks. So, yeah, if you're Washington, you don't overthink this. You take the, the obvious choice, which is Jaden Daniels. I thought that was a great answer right there about Jaden Daniels and, and the fact that start to finish, according to Mel, Jaden was perfect. Jaden didn't do anything wrong. Jaden didn't have, you know, a spell where it's like, okay, what was going on there? Oh, he got hot at the right time. No, start of the season to the end of the season, he was fantastic, right? And he, as Mel said, the only quarterback that could say that. So, again, another reason why Raider Nation, another reason why AP, another reason why, you know, I want Jaden Daniels. Again, it's going to be so difficult because it feels like it's already set in stone that Washington is going to pick him at number two. Uh, final soundbite I have for you, and there was a lot more. Like I said, this thing went on for an hour, a little bit over an hour. This also was a question that I asked him, and it was about the running backs. And I started off talking about the fact that you know, the veteran running backs, including Josh Jacobs, including Derrick Henry, you know, you saw Aaron Jones, you saw Tony Pollard, Saquon Barkley, all those guys went off the board quickly in free agency, got better money than they did a year ago. So what does that tell you about the running back class this year in the draft? And also who stands out and who kind of separates themselves and those running backs that could be drafted coming up at the end of April? Yeah, you knew it wasn't going to be a first rounder and you knew that the second round was going to be iffy for Jonathan Brooks with the ACL. You know, after he got hurt on November 11th. So even if you thought going into the year, Brooks could be a guy, but he kind of emerged as the year went along. So when you looked and projected in August, you knew this year might not. I said even during the year, you might have a running back go to the third round. Then Brooks has the ACL, and I'm thinking, okay, late second possibly. Something Trey Benson after running that 4-3-9 from Florida State could be a late two. You know, some think you could get maybe, possibly, if you talk about Blake Corum into that third round discussion. I like Jalen Wright from Tennessee in the third, fourth round. But when you talk about early rounders, we just didn't have that in terms of round one, maybe round two with Brooks. Uh, I think Marshawn Lloyd from USC, Audric Estime from Notre Dame, or a couple other guys to keep an eye on. I think when you look at day three, Rasheen Ali from Marshall. Uh, Sione Vaki, who was a safety, played some Wildcat, 
running back at Utah impressed me there. Jawar Jordan, I thought, would run better than he did at Louisville, but he may get pushed down because that, like him. Kamani Vidal from Troy is an interesting guy. Jaden Sheridan from Monmouth, tremendous production. He has a nice burst to daylight, like him coming out of Monmouth as a day three pick. And Dylan Lobby, a Lobby from uh, New Hampshire, catches the ball out of the backfield, went to the Senior Bowl. Um, uh, they brought him down there. Uh, Jim Nagy did. And Lauby is a guy, when you get into the sixth, seventh round with his versatility, catching the ball out of the backfield the way he did, uh, makes some sense. So, yeah, you'll always be able to find a day three running backs. And last year, the Ravens got a guy, Keith Mitchell wasn't even drafted out of East Carolina. Fastest player on the team, had production. He is the son of a player, Anthony Mitchell, in the NFL with the Ravens. Doesn't even get drafted and was an integral part of that team until he got hurt late in the year. So you can always, I say that every year, you can always find running backs day three, and in some cases even as undrafted free agents. The Ravens hit with Priest Holmes back in the day out of Texas. They hit with Keaton Mitchell, and we see it with Isaiah Pacheco in the seventh round on a two-time Super Bowl team with the Chiefs. So, yeah, so I'm going to hold to that. And a lot of people have jumped on that bandwagon. I was getting ripped for it years ago. It makes no sense. You know, you're, you're crazy if you can't you know, say you should and take a running back in the first round and I, I've held to that and uh, I maintain that I started that about 15 years ago and I, I maintain that philosophy weight on the running back position and you can find guys that can be key performers and a lot of the guys that were successful even winning Super Bowls or getting to Super Bowls worth the second team Fournette second team McCaffrey got the Super Bowl second team so again I would definitely always wait on the running back position so I love that answer from Mel it was a very passionate energetic he you could tell he got a little bit more pep in his step it was actually the final question asked in the in the uh the the conference call that we had on thursday but uh he's very adamant about no first round running backs and he says you should never have a first round running back and he's been saying it for years and i know that's a fact that he's been saying it for years but this year it really shows that and again going back to free agency there was a reason why all these guys got paid as quickly as they did just because again this running back class doesn't have the b john robinson doesn't have the josh jacobs doesn't have the you know insert Jameer Gibbs big time wire, uh, running back there doesn't have those guys and so he's saying that there might be a guy who goes in the second round but probably not even until the third round so uh it's a deep deep running back class but not elite deep if you know what I mean but I thought that was a fantastic answer right there from Mel talking all things running backs and again that's just you know five quick sound bites from Mel, his whole conference call went one hour long one hour strong and then a little bit later on in the evening He's on my radio show talking. So it was a day full of Mel Kuyper Jr. for your boy. Coming up in segment number three, your calls and texts draft that Lockdown Raider podcast voicemail line, 707-654-4693. Here we go, Raider Nation. Segment number three of today's Lockdown Raiders podcast. Your calls and texts draft that Lockdown Raider podcast voicemail line, 707-654-4693. Running a little bit. Uh, long on this show so far, so I probably won't be able to get as many calls in and, and texts in as possible, but we'll try to go ahead and knock out a few real quick, including a text from Steve in L.A. He said, Q, Steve from L.A., I've left voicemails before, but my English isn't good. Anyway, I always question the people that say that we don't have the weapons to trade for a quarterback. We have a defense. We have wide receiver, tight end, weapons. Colton Miller at left tackle. Do we need a right tackle? Sure. Munford is a left tackle, moved to right tackle. He looked better at left tackle. He might not be versatile to be as good on the right tackle, but he is good enough to start in the league. I honestly want to hear how we do not have a team to be able to trade for a quarterback. People forget that AP was hired because he can bring the best out of players. He isn't rebuilding. He's expected to have a top five defense like the end of last season and have a better offense, which isn't that hard to accomplish because our offense was the worst. AP beat the Chiefs with one hand tied behind his back. No offense. What I'm saying is that trading up for a quarterback and at least sign rotational players should be enough to be in the running for a playoff run. That's Stephen L.A. Fantastic text, my man. I appreciate you. And yeah, I'm not worried about, you know, the, the, the English on the voicemails. We just have so many. Sometimes I don't get to all of them. I apologize for that. But really good text. And I'm with you. I think the Raiders have the roster that's in place to go ahead and make a move for the quarterback. Uh, if you're going to do it, do it now. What, I mean, what, what are you waiting for, right? Because Devontae is only going to get a year older. Max is going to get just another year of wear and tear on his body. Jacoby Myers is a really good player. He showed you that the first year he was with the team, right? I, I, I'm with you. I think that the team is set in a good position. They just signed Christian Wilkins. The defense should be better. Tyree Wilson should be better. Malcolm Kuntz came on at the end of the season. Like, There's a lot to like about this roster right now. Are there holes that need to be filled? Sure. You know, Adam Kaplan on, on, on uh, the show on Thursday said that the Raiders had a whole lot of holes. I don't agree that they had a whole lot. I do think that there's some areas, obviously the right side of the offensive line, 
Uh, you know, could they use uh, another cornerback? Sure. You know, so I, I see that. See a couple holes here and there. But for the most part, I think that they have a roster. If they had to go to Allegiant Stadium on Sunday and play a game, they could definitely win. And that's without going and getting the top flight quarterback. That's with Aiden O'Connell or Gardner Minshew. Right? I, I think right now they could do that. Do they need another running back? Sure. But they can get one a little bit later on in the draft. Right now they've got Zamir White and, uh, and Alexander Madison. I think those guys can carry the load for at least one game, right? So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I don't think that the Raiders have so many holes where they can't go make the move. I actually think that right now is the ideal time to go make the move. Thanks so much for this, the text, Steve. I do appreciate you. Up next, got a call from 360 Raider. He's calling to talk about a few options the Raiders have in the upcoming draft. Here he is, 360 Raider. What's up, Q? This is 360 Raider. Hey, I'm just calling in to give you my two cents worth on the upcoming draft. Uh, maybe a perspective that I haven't heard uh, talked about much uh, in the media. Uh, the first one being the Raiders could trade back, right? So with Penix and Bo Nix possibly being a target of the Raiders, those quarterbacks could be available in the latter part of the first or even second round. And if that's the case, I would not be upset if the Raiders traded back into the, I don't know, 20s or something like that uh, to pick up more people because they, they need more draft picks. Uh, one other thing uh, for people who want the Raiders to move up in the draft, I can totally see that happening also. With a team like the Patriots, at number three, can you imagine the draft capital, the Raiders 13, maybe two other first-round draft picks, sprinkle in a few other draft picks in there, plus being able to draft Bo Nix or Michael Penix? That would be huge. I mean, that would be some way to build a team. So I think, I think New England would be crazy to pass on something like that. Anyway, I just thought I'd call you and uh, give you my perspective. Have a good day and go Raiders. Thanks so much for the call. Appreciate you, brother. Trade back and collect more draft picks, then add to the roster, fill some holes, trade up to get the star quarterback that you believe Jaden Daniels is going to be. I mean, there are multiple options, you know, including staying at pick 13 and making the best pick possible. That was actually my question I had for Raider Nation on Raider Nation Radio 920 on Thursday. You know, if they do stay at 13, what would you like them to do? Pick the best quarterback there, which would probably be Bo Nix or, or Michael Penix. Pick the best offensive tackle that's on the board. Pick the best cornerback that's on the board. Pick the best defensive tackle that's on the board or even trade back. Like you mentioned, trade back, collect more picks. Like what would Raider Nation prefer? I thought it was a really good conversation we had on Thursday. So they're in, you know, one of those triple threat positions. They could do so many different things at 13. I know that they really want to get up to number two and go get the quarterback, but there's no telling if they're going to be able to get that. You heard in, uh, in segment number two from Mel Kuyper when he was saying that, yeah, I'm sure Jaden would like to play with AP. AP definitely wants to coach him up, but – uh, sounds like Washington is really set in their ways that they're going to go get Jaden Daniels, number two overall, in uh, in April's draft or April 25th draft in Detroit. So thanks so much for that call, man. Really good stuff. Up next, I got a text from Southern Indiana Raider. It says, hey, Q, Southern Indiana Raider here. Just like every year up until now, I'm getting jittery about the draft. This team has blown it so many times. I want to feel better going into this one. I'm not. I want Daniels, but I don't see it happening. Penix is totally within reach, and I feel like they're going to blow that too. Until there's an upper-tier quarterback here, there's no deep runs in the playoffs. Tell me how I'm wrong. Thanks for all that you do, and give me my first listen daily. That's Southern Indiana Raider. And really, it depends on what you think Michael Penix is, right? I mean, do you think that he's a top-tier quarterback? I, I have him as quarterback number two. I actually would like to roll the dice, though, and not pick him at number 13. I'd like to either pick him in the second round, maybe trade up in the second round, or even trade up into the back end of round one. But the problem is the two teams sitting there at the back end, the very back end of uh, round one, are the Chiefs at 32 and the Niners at 31, <laughs> right? So I don't know if the Chiefs are going to want to do business with the Raiders so they can go get a quarterback. The Niners, they might, you know, who knows. But uh, it, it's – it's, it's tricky, man. Again, I like him a lot, but I think that they can get an impact player at 13. I would like to see them go get Jaden Daniels, but we've gone over this plenty of times before that it's going to be a tough out to try to go get him. But 
Uh, I got faith in Tom Telesco. I think that that's the one thing that we're forgetting about. Telesco's been there, done that. He's got experience. You know, I said that earlier this week, and, and I do feel like that that experience is really going to help him moving forward and help this team moving forward where when the draft is all said and done, when we're back on Monday following the draft, we're not talking about what the hell was that? What they did what at, at 13? Wait, they did what at 44? They picked who, right? I, I don't think we're going to have those conversations. I really don't. That could be me just looking through silver and black glasses, but I, I really don't believe that. I think that the Raiders are in good hands with Tom Telesco. He's had a history of being able to get really good talent out of the draft. So thanks so much for the text. I do appreciate you. Up next, got a call from Big E in the 209. He's calling to talk about the draft process and what he's reading as far as what the Raiders are looking at or aren't looking at with pick number 13. Here he is, Big E in the 209. What up, Q? Big E from the 209, man. Uh, i just seen a couple of reports saying that, uh, like bleach reports, so a couple of things were saying that Raiders are not eyeing a QB at pick 13. And can I just say, thank God, like, I get it with the QB hype when it comes to, you know, the draft. Everybody gets excited about talking about the quarterback, and it is. It's really exciting. I, I'm eating it up. I'm listening to every single episode, Michael Penix conversation, the Jace Daniels. I'm listening to all the conversations. But at the end of the day, Number one, I I have all trust in Tom Telesco. He's built great teams, but he's not the one coaching them, like you said in the previous episode. Um, but I'm just listening to what the gentleman you had on the show um, just this past, I just listened to it right now. He was saying he's not impressed with a lot of the quarterbacks. They, I mean, he's not super impressed. He didn't seem like he was over the top about a bunch of them, you know. Um, and I get it. Every draft prospect is going to have some issues here and there. Uh, there's no perfect prospect. But if we're not going to be able to get our guy, how about we just build around, build the team, build a great team? I'd rather have that scenario you uh, talked about a couple episodes ago where we have a team already built around a guy, or excuse me, had have a team already built, and all we do have to, all we have to do is plug a guy in because the team is already built around him. I really feel Gardner Minshew and Aiden O'Connell uh, battling it out is going to be really good. I ultimately think uh, Minshew, because he's a little mobile, will win that. But if you have weapons around him, and a really good defense. And, I mean, we're going to need – we need an O-line. We need to address the O-line. That has not been addressed for years. I mean, last time it was addressed, you know, Alex Leatherwood is it. And uh, he's out of the league now. So, regardless of whoever's throwing the ball, they're going to need some protection. So, instead of skimping, how about we just focus and get get the O-line and get everything built up and then plug the guy in. Anyway, want to know your thoughts on that, Q. Um, Again, love the show. Thanks for all the inside information. It's, it's crazy how we're in the off season and it's still we're still going in strong on Raider news. You know, it's crazy stuff. So, anyway, have a good one, Q. Stay strong. Have a good one. Raider Nation, let's go. Thank you for the call, my man. I appreciate you. And I mean, that's definitely an option, right? I mean, if they stay at thirteen, as I rolled it out earlier, and I talked about Thursday's show on Raider Nation Radio nine twenty, all the different options, they don't have to be looking at a quarterback at thirteen. If they're sitting at thirteen, they could say, you know what, the quarterback that we want is not there. You know, he went number two. We don't want Penix. We don't want Knicks, so we'll wait. We'll do something else. And they can go and attack it in so many different directions. So uh, I, I think that they're aware of that, and, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of, like I mentioned before, there's so many different options on the table. That's probably going to be the fun part of it is seeing exactly what direction they go if, in fact, they can't get to number two. So there it is. Thanks so much for that. We'll get it, uh, and we'll close out with one text uh, from Ridiculous Raider. It says, hey, Q. Ridiculous Raider here in San Mateo, San Mateo. Love the show, man. Keep doing your thing as always. As far as Adam Kaplan goes, those were definitely some great nuggets that he dropped on Thursday's show. But I want to propose an idea and get some pushback to this statement on Fuaga. I don't think that he's a left tackle just because a kid is good. Doesn't mean he needs to move from his natural position of right tackle to left tackle, especially considering if we got Fuaga, then traded up in the later part of the first round for Penix, who is left-handed. Then we'd have a great right tackle to protect his blind side. To me, that's the best-case scenario and combo to improve our team. Fawaga and Penix would be one hell of a haul. I think forcing the guy to play a position he's not used to is pretty antiquated, thinking in the NFL. We've seen many fail with the transition from right tackle to left tackle. That's just my two thoughts, or two are just my thoughts. Peace out from Ridiculous Raider. And, yeah, I was, I was with you on that as well. I like Fawaga as a right tackle. I know what Adam said about him uh, moving over to the left tackle position. And you're right about Penix. Uh, the right tackle is the blind, the blind spot, right? I mean, that's, that's the side that you got to protect the, the quarterback's blind spot. So if you go and end up with Penix, yeah, you definitely want to get that right tackle position held down. And that might be why you get the right tackle first. A guy like Fuaga, you get him at number 13, and then you, you know, wait a little while and get Penix. If that's your one-two punch, then you probably want to get the offensive tackle first 
and then try to get the quarterback. You know, instead of, you know, trying to trade up and get the quarterback, got to ensure that we get the quarterback. Why don't you take the best offensive tackle, like the best offensive tackle? You know, I hear people say, oh, it's deep in the draft. You can get one later. Well, why just get one? Why not get the best, the best one that's available, right? And then you have him, like you said, in the trenches for the next 10 years. And then you've got him and Colton Miller. And, you know, of course, you got Thayer Mumford in the mix as well. He might be a guard. He might end up taking uh, Colton Miller's spot when Colton's really ready to move on. I mean, there's so many different options there that you can have. But I would love Fuaga at that right tackle position. I think that you're onto something for that for sure. So thanks so much for that text. That's all I got time for. Got a call from Raider Eddie in Denver. We'll get that on Monday's show. A text from Brent from Boston. We'll get that on Monday's show as well. We'll have more news and notes uh, depending on what happens over the weekend. Maybe I'll bring that Mel Kuyper Jr. interview to the show. I thought it was some really good stuff on my ESPN radio show game night uh, that I did on Thursday night. Uh, we can always have some more Mel Kuyper Jr. breakdowns because I have plenty of them. Right Again, his, his conference call was at one hour long, one hour strong. There's a lot to get to. Trust and believe that as we get closer and closer to the start of the NFL draft in Detroit starting April 25th. So until Monday, Raider Nation, have a fantastic weekend. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Love on your family. Most importantly, as always, just win, baby.